So I am going to talk about uh, some projects um, where uh, that bring together artists, scientists, and educators, um, um, and where we dance together at the interface of art and science. Um, so I visualize also interbrain synchrony in a range of projects. Um, I kind of want to start because I wanted to plug uh, an ERC project that I'm going to hopefully start this summer uh, uh, from the University of Amsterdam, where we're really trying to bring together all of the dance work as well uh, in uh, uh, questions uh, surrounding uh, cross-generational communication. So uh, we uh, talk and interact with people from different generations uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we know quite a bit uh, from the lab about how we process language, about motor uh, system changes, about all sorts of things that change in our brains and in our behaviors and in our movements uh, throughout the lifespan. I also know that there are talks in this conference around uh, you know, uh, bringing dance and neurorehabilitation and old and uh, elderly people, or there is work on you know children and uh, children and dance therapy, uh, but there is very little work on bringing this either both outside of the lab and to look at cross generational interactions. Um, so oftentimes, uh, the people study children, adults or older adults. Um, there's some uh, start of research with uh, in the synchrony field that I'm from with uh, parents and children, but very little uh, between grandparents and children or grandparents and adults. And I'll try to explain why I think that that is actually a really interesting field. And Emily Cross, I have no idea if she's there, if she was also uh, logging in remotely um, as part of the project. So. Uh, who am I? I work at uh, NYU as a research associate professor, um, and I'm going to also be affiliated with the University of Amsterdam. And uh, my background is in dance, uh, as in many people here, and visual arts. And I've brought that to the neurosciences and try to reintegrate this. Um, and really, uh, through this real world neuroscience approach, where I try to pair a laboratory with real world um, studies, um, I use a community science approach where I try to in involve people uh, in the ideation process of my research as much as possible uh, as well. And I'll show some examples of that with dancers. Um, and then I uh, do hyperscanning, uh, which I guess there was an example from just now and probably many throughout the day since um, where I use mobile uh, brain and body uh, imaging uh, techniques to do so um, in combination with real-time uh, biofeedback installation that sonify and visualize how our brains and bodies uh, may synchronize with each other uh, at different moments in time. So here's one example. Um, it's a compatibility racer where uh, the synchrony uh, between uh, the brains of two people who ride this racer is translated into the motor speed of a card that goes faster as uh, synchrony increases um, and then slows down uh, as it decreases. So here you see people trying out different strategies. So they're having a conversation, but they're having more of a body conversation like mirroring task, right? This is, this is not instructed in any way. People very naturally come up with different strategies that might synchronize their brains and make the card go faster. Um, this uh, installation uh, also really drives home how important it is to pair real world research with laboratory research. Uh, since as you can see, you know, people are moving their heads around a lot and that's not very conducive to, uh, it's conducive to the fun, but not so much to the data quality uh, of what we get from these works, right? So um, I will be working in phases. Um, in phase one, I'll be working with community partners like uh, Iseka Amsterdam, a dance company that I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, um, where we'll record um, both uh, speech data, movement data, and other kinds of interaction data from people from multiple families from multiple generations um, as they're engaging in storytelling and doing movement advanced that we will be designing together with families uh, from the community and with our community partners. Then we'll bring the data that we collect, the, the stories and the dance, et cetera, to the lab to have other people listen to and watch what they did to get a more controlled uh, sample. And then whatever we find there from the brain data, we will use it as our uh, focus or like search light basically onto the data from the messier real world uh, of findings. Because, and I know that this is probably the experience that many of many people here share, is that you can, a lot of our 
experiments, especially when it comes to using dancers in a performative context, really suffer from us not being able to draw these generalizable conclusions from the data because of the sample size or of the uh, just other, like uh, the idiosyncrasy basically of what we're doing. Okay, so what are some of the benefits of, uh, or research questions that you can address by uh, bringing children, adults and older adults uh, kind of into the same sphere? Um, uh, we think that it can address uh, questions around what kinds of drivers there are of synchrony and what the meaning might be uh, in terms of both, you know, neurocognitive effects, but also social behavior. Um, so on the left, it's just, you know, I've, I've just tried and many people have done this in different shapes to really characterize all the different factors that have seemed to contribute to um, synchrony. And so in the sense of social closeness and common ground, which is one of the core purposes of social interaction, at least the ones that I'm focusing on. Um, and so if you look at children, adults, and older adults, um, there are some neural factors that change, uh, right? Uh, our brain rhythms are like basic uh, neural rhythms, uh, baseline neural rhythms change as a function of age. For example, alpha peak frequency uh, in children is, uh, or like the baseline alpha peak frequency is about the same as older adults. So you get this U shape. Um, so that might predict that um, there are uh, the children and older adults are actually, you know, by default, more in sync with each other than children might be with their parents or that older ad adult might uh, might be with their parents. Um, and in fact, some simulation work we did in collaboration, I should put their faces up uh, with Natalie Brito and Guillaume Dumas, uh, really, really suggests that um, this is true on the one hand, but that interestingly, the buffer of the presence of an adult actually increases synchrony among all the, uh, all the pairs. Um, and that then really resonates with some real world uh you know findings around you know the uh the benefits of living in multi-generational households for example and so then the question is how does that uh, like so that might be one outcome is you know the like the, these like social uh um, societal benefits that we see in multi-generational outcomes but we can ask this in a more specific question as well oh sorry and so for joint action we know that uh, adults tend to, uh, like young adults, tend to be a little better. Well, not better. I mean, their their brains tend to be more entrained uh, to speech rhythms, for example, than uh, young children and older adults might be. Although the findings here are um, can be contradictory, but uh, this is just one generalization we might draw just for the purposes of illustration. Um, and that is also true in the actual acts of, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, speech and, and joint action. So here we might ex expect, again, the adults to dissociate. Um, but when it comes to, for example, um, joint action or, or uh, conversations, then we might see actually that uh, old, older adults are still able to accommodate because they have uh, re the, there's um, they have done certain things in in their lives that are still they've still learned whereas children still have to learn some things that they need to then uh, accommodate to the, uh, the others so accommodation or adapting to um, you know the movements uh, movements or speech rhythms uh, of others is very is easier uh, if behaviors are salient and um, mutually adaptive right so um, we know that people can change their alpha rhythms, but they're not immediately visible. Um, so a salient speech rate is salient, movements are salient. And if we can, we will adapt to those, right? Like we adapt our speech rate uh, to our children or to, uh, to uh, older people if we feel that that is appropriate. And actually older adults also are able to uh, adapt their, uh, their rates and their um, um, and things like predictive processing to younger adults and children. Um, but um, some things are not yet available for kids, like predictive processing, right? This is something that they still have to learn, uh, both in movement coordination and in, in conversation. Uh, and the same goes for alpha peak uh, frequencies. That's, that is mutually adaptive, but not necessarily salient. So this is where the uh, real-time biofeedback part comes in, um, because now we can make something that is internal, um, salient, and uh, mutually adaptive. And we can ask whether that actually improves uh, communicative outcomes. And we have some 
uh, data from museum installations suggesting that in fact, um, there is benefit to showing people their synchrony, their brain synchrony and their body synchrony in real time uh, when it comes to their ability to adapt their behaviors over time and that inducing more synchrony and sense and the sense of uh, uh, social connectedness. So I would want to focus for the, uh, the rest of my talk on uh, uh, on on hone in on the collaborations with dancers on making, getting to the point where we can really systematically investigate uh, our uh, synch uh, synch body synchrony and the effects of communication. So here's, um, and I, there's a soundscape also, but I know it's probably not entirely, you hear it? Yeah, right? Sort of. Anyway, you should imagine everybody has their own instrument, um, everybody has their own color. Um, and the assignment here is that people engage in a body conversation task, both facing each other and through the digital interfaces. And then we have a battery of questions around how connected they felt. And we also look at their movement synchrony and their movement quality. So stupidly, I think I failed to put the, uh, the graph of the results on here. I'm sorry about that, but you should, um, Imagine a graph that shows, or a figure that shows that uh, from diets of, uh, you can see images, we get people of different generations when we do this in, in uh, museum environments, um, that uh, people tend to synchronize their movements more in a face-to-face -face interaction, uh, and instantaneously that is, but when it comes to screen-based installations, they, they're moved, they try to, they don't synchronize at a zero lag, which makes a lot of sense because of there's a, the intrinsic delay, but they try out bigger uh, movements to do so, and that uh, mediates their sense of uh, connectedness. Um, this, was the, this uh, we've done these kinds of you know, uh, visualizing synchrony in various contexts. Um, and it serves also as a tool to bring in the public in conversations around synchrony and social connectedness. So here's an example, uh, Neuro Tango, that was from 10 years ago, where we had couples compete against each other for synchrony. Um, and then had a conversation about what tango, uh, like how tango really, you know, makes people feel like they're moving in one body, for example. Um, sorry, let me just see if I can skip this slide. Um, the more uh, systematic investigations around synchrony that we've done is in collaboration with Iseka Amsterdam. Um, and they are a dance group who for a very long time have worked with notions of synchrony and uh, synchronicity, and they've even developed their own vocabulary uh, uh, around pre-choreographic elements that incorporate a lot of notions that uh, we study uh, as uh, synchrony researchers. So um, this has culminated. This collaboration has been very fruitful and has culminated in a series of outcomes. Mm -hmm. Here's one example of a performance that we did at the mm -hmm. Ballet National de Marseille where we visualized both the movements uh, and the synchrony between dancers. Um, and here the synchrony is actually dictated by uh, the neural uh, of the, the pull and the push, sorry, of these visualizations is actually dictated by uh, the synchrony between the brains of two audience members that are pulling and push them together and pushing them apart. So we've built a, a taxonomy uh, of synchrony together throughout workshops uh, that we've done throughout uh, through the year, where you know we've we signed, we invited scientists and dancers to get together. Uh, everybody moved and everybody talked, um, and uh, we came up by the end of this with kind of like a taxonomy of these uh, bringing together the vocabulary from both the dancers and the scientists. Um, of what you're actually going for. Uh, a linguist might say common ground, uh, a dancer might say a dual utopia or one body uh, synergy. Um, the forms of, syn syn uh, forms of synchrony, like are you doing things simultaneously or together? Um, are you mirroring and coordinating, right? Like there's not, like it's, it, synchrony is kind of like this catch-all term that we've been using. Uh, units that can synchronize that are mediated by our body bodies. Um, and then also vehicles, right? So uh, anticipation and resonance are notions that have their correlates both in the way we think about how our brains and bodies make things possible from a scientific perspective, but also uh, are very relevant in the dance realm. 
Um, so we uh, generated and started with um, uh, an experiment, trying to trying to push an experimental design onto a performative choreography in a way that doesn't feel too much, like that you can forget that you're in an experiment basically um, by making it mostly aesthetically uh, uh, interesting as an artistic experience. Um, with the question, uh, and because of what I was talking about earlier, that it is very hard to get usable data from the uh, from brain uh, brain uh, usable brain data from dancers that are freely moving around, uh, we try we try to ask questions about the relationship between uh, movement synchrony during the dance phrase and uh, I wonder if this is going to start um, using open pose. Uh, it looks like it might not be playing. Sorry, there is an open pose video I think here. Apologies. Yeah. Anyway, I think many people here know. Um, yeah. So basically the idea being that we look at synchrony in the brains during these tuning anticipation phases of different conditions uh, that are really just instructions for the mindsets basically of the dancers um, and then look at movement synchrony during the dance phrase um, and then again at brain synchrony during uh, the resonance phrase. Um, and a major challenge here, and this is what I was trying to allude to earlier, is of course also that um, the general, so maybe Maybe we might solve some of the data quality issues, but it's not entirely clear that we have, uh, with just two performers, have solved the the challenge of the idiosyncrasy. Anyway, I think you get it <laughs> of uh, these uh, of the data that we'll be gathering if we are only working with a small set of performance performers, right? So we're still trying to figure out that challenge. Um, one question that arises from this is whether these constructs map onto different metrics, right? So now if we have these psychologically relevant constructs, how can we map those on to different ways that we might measure synchrony? Um, like there's so many ways, right? So greater causality, circular correlation coefficient. Um, if you're using the brain, there's like different frequency ranges and these, those might map onto differently meaningful things. Um, so to give an example, here is an installation that we did that's the mutual wave machine where two people sit opposite each other in a pod uh, that where that where light, the light grows if you're in sync and it shrinks if you're not in sync with each other. And we collected data from thousands of people at different festivals and museums uh, across the US and uh, Europe. Um, and we asked people to try out these different strategies um, and uh, saw that, for example, when you look at eye contact, um, that definitely increased synchrony in uh, people over, in diets over time. Um, so it was an effective strategy, one might say, but only in one of the metrics at different at expected uh, frequency ranges. If people were trying to do st stuff together, we see an increase in synchrony over time in a different measure and a different frequency range. And then thinking something together, like thinking about your favorite ice cream, which was something that came up a lot, surprisingly, um, uh, we didn't see any effects there. But that is also very likely due to the limitations of our metrics, right? Because we know from fMRI research that uh, people who have shared representations really do show similar brain activity as they are processing the world around them, right? We're just not capturing this here. Um, and so when I then begin to start thinking about the different ways that these frequencies and metrics interact and bring the fold back in of what I was saying earlier around these different generations and all these different elements of what predicts synchrony and, and subsequent social connectedness, um, because we see that these also co-modulate. It's just one example of what might happen in a dyadic uh, interaction um, is that uh, I say I'm interacting with Marla and uh, we're uh, talking to each other, looking at each other face to face. Um, and my attention, if this happens over a 10 minute period or so, my attention is gonna flow in and out of sync. Like it's not because I don't like Marla, I like her a lot, but it's mostly because we're not, we're just not a, we typically don't like keep, you know, this attend, it goes in phases and fluctuates across time, right? Uh, and Marilis has similarly these attention states that fluctuate in and out of sync, and especially when you're uh, working in uh, the situation that we are. Um, and so the more, you can imagine that the more 
those two coincide with each other, which is measurable through shared power fluctuations between the two of us, that is actually going to then also offer more opportunities for us to, uh, you know, to build shared representations or to engage in joint action that is actually synchronous at uh, several levels of representation, right? So that's a natural um, possibility, basically, that uh, we can now start asking more specific questions about. Um, another, uh, and I, I wanted to close by moving uh, into just the value that I'm sure has been discussed um, many uh, often throughout here, not just from, so the, the, there's a bi-directional benefit, I hope, uh, from the scientific perspective toward the artist, uh, artists as well. Um, and obviously, I, I hope to have shown that, you know, working with artists has very much inspired the scientific side of the work. Um, and that is also true more broadly, not just in the um, in our context. So I wanted to use, if I'm not sure if people have yet, uh, uh, use uh, uh, the uh, ET as an example. So I started working on, I saw ET decades ago um, and uh, I uh, didn't fully realize, and then I started doing synchrony research and then I watched it again. And then I did, and only then did I realize that in the, uh, at that time, uh, um, there was a scene in the movie that specifically addressed synchrony. So there is one scene where uh, E.T. Uh, is uh, dying uh, because he can't handle the atmosphere on Earth. It's a very impressive scene if you're a young child, right? There's a lot of, you know, medical professionals going around because it's not just E.T. who is dying. E.T. is dragging Elliot down with him, right? The little boy. Boy who discovered him, and um, the there was a moment where the doctors are like, there, uh, there's perfect coherence between their uh, their brains and bodies. They are wearing all these sensors, and so that's what's happening. Like he's like the, this coherence is dragging Elliot down into death with, uh, 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 with together with ET. And it's only when they break this coherence and this synchrony that Elliot lives and then E.T. can go home. And so that is just a really important note because for um, not anymore so much, but for a very long time, we were all like kind of assuming synch um, better, more synchrony is better. But of course, now we know that it's really just, it, it's very much about the balancing act and you need to think about these things very carefully. Um, and another project that I really wanted to, that I just wanted to note is by uh, Bogomir Derinquin, which is, which I think is beautiful it's called i dance alone uh and we were like we were in conversation about looking at synchrony on the dance floors and he comes from a a, a background where he was in um uh ex yugoslavia at the time like or like uh, um, in uh, in the early 90s during the war time um and uh, this and there is a lot of release in go, coming together and dancing and synchronizing from this uh, uh, from going through this terrible experience, and it's a it's a it's a unifying, uh, unifying and synchronizing experience. So there's a lot of value that is not just positive, but also negative, or like negative positive through negative, and it's not all the better. And I wanted to close with uh, one video from uh, the Netherlands Society for Psychiatry, where we did a performance again together with uh, Isika Amsterdam uh, on uh, connecting and uh, failing to connect. Uh, to others and the friction and the um, loneliness that can arise uh, from this in uh, a time where we are in a loneliness ep epidemic. So. It's very long, so we can just uh, kind of watch one. I'm realizing I put the whole video in here, but it's we can watch just 10 seconds of it and then um, I can keep it running with questions because I know that we are at time, even though we started a little later. Just to explain, these are four dancers who are on stage at the on the main stage of the Netherlands Society for Psychiatry last year in Maastricht in the Netherlands. Um, and they are engaged in interacting with the harmonic dissonance visual. And the more they synchronize, the more visible their faces become. So like, just look for here, you can see that their bodies 
are becoming more visible as they are more similar in their uh, to the pe to uh, people around them, and it can be two or more uh, uh, or more people. And so they can at some point. I don't know if we're going to find any of those, but there are some points where they basically quote unquote climax. Oh yeah, here you can see, and as uh, three people are doing the same thing, you get these. Uh, it becomes the 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 kind of flow simulations disappear and their bodies behind it appear. But as you can see, the second person is still uh, not uh, uh, not working or not synchronizing. And um, anyway, yeah, I'll stop, I'll, I can stop here and just let the visuals run if that works. Yeah, you have us mesmerized um, and it's it's beautiful because of uh, some of the work that I've been doing on on agency through through coordination, right? Through synchrony, we have always, I, I consider a synchrony as being a, a merging, but this is such a beautiful example of of it being a way of discovering self, right? Of, of having that representation of self. Yeah. It's stunning. Um, I, I would like to make sure we have at least one question to Suzanne, but I do want to also say thank you because you're my hero. I love you. And you never mm -hmm. fail to impress. Most importantly, because she got both dance and dialogue into her talk, right? So yes. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, a question from Julien first. Go ahead, Julien. I didn't know. Oh, really? So then it was a hand your body okay go you're merging Suzanne, thank you uh, amazing talk and amazing work uh, i just it actually follows a little bit the et case uh, my question so i'm wondering in all the multiple um years of doing this kind of interpersonal uh, synchronization do you find other specific ways that brain synchronize exactly when people do different things like i'm kind of i'm, I'm kind of you know in some interest of this is a good example of what you're showing now, like yeah, a certain thing that, you know, the brains, our brains look similar when we do the same things, when we look at the same things. We know that, and that's, you know, good, bad, I don't know. It has, it's good and bad maybe, but as an as a dancer, or whatever, I kind of am very curious and actually sense, when we sense a sense of, of togetherness that is associated with being very different from each other. And I'm wondering if there's brain data that talks, do you have experience of like finding some kind of measure Oh, oh yeah, I don't know if my question is clear. Yeah. No, your question is very clear. So for one, I mean, I guess there's two answers, two possible answers. The first answer is kind of no, uh, in the sense that we don't know, but this is this is what we're really trying to get at. So in the bottom, you also see where we were trying to figure out different choreographies that allow you to dissociate the togetherness from the simul from the simultaneity. So we ended up working with, uh, for example, some classical ballet <laughs> structures that everybody knows that they can just like, you can just learn and uh, and be wrote about it. Um, so then you can try to see if there's ways that you can play around with like the tuning to each other as a doing something together versus doing the same thing at the same time. So that's one aspect of it. Um, coordination, like dialogue and conversation. Uh, so this that I've done much more in, uh, so we have the body conversation now, so it's not all mirroring, but also coordination. Um, that I don't see the, the leader follower relationship, but it is something that is obviously very relevant uh, in dialogue because you're not actually doing the same thing. You're coordinating with each other. And I feel, I mean, there's people who are thinking about this very carefully, but I also wonder if some people, uh, but it's a very hard problem to understand those uh, uh, because you might also have shifts in timing. Who's the leader? Who's the follower? Um, and then um, it is, and then just to your point about like, yes, we know that the bra our brains do the same thing when we're exposed to the same thing. Um, that is true, but I do also think that that is very, there can be very valuable information had from differences between us that occur despite the fact that we are seeing the same thing because, and that is something that is really, you know, I believe, I think has become very prevalent throughout the years that people have been doing synchrony research is that it's not exactly the same. There's always, uh, even though there's like, you know, there's a huge entrainment factor or whatever you want to call it or stimulus brain factor, uh, what we bring to the table in the way that we process this information is different between individuals and it's different meaningfully for social situations. Um, so I think that that's, I hope that that kind of answers some of the questions in the sense that we don't know the answer to empirical answer, but uh, we're very aware of the of the questions. Yeah. And I think that's why your generational, multi-generational stuff is so perfect, right? Because it, it situates that question with a with a real a real world uh, 
context and, and I think a very important uh, discussion that has to be had. We have time for the shortest, tiniest question because we have Stephen Brown in the room. Annika, quick. Uh, yes, thank you, Suzanne, for your talk. I was curious about the slide where you differentiate between forms, vehicles, and I forgot the third term of synchrony. And I just wanted to sort of ask, how did you get to this? <laughs> uh, we had a series of workshops with dancers, with the dancers. Um, so we came together. Um, this was, I think, the second year. So we did this over the course of multiple years. And I think we came together in the second year. Uh, uh, we did this uh, after Sugito Orcs. I don't know if he's maybe there. It was in the room as well, and some other people. Um, and uh, and we came to this as kind of like a compromise after a week long of working together. Uh, uh, but that was the second year that we got together. As a, um, does that uh, is there a specific reason? I mean, like I'm not saying this is exclusive, right, at all, or the be all. It's just an illustration. But I think I was wondering also in relation to what Asaf was asking, whether it was sort of a way to get beyond just synchrony to, to have a more complex understanding of synchrony. Yeah, to uh, um, to really, yeah, to really break it down into what we're really talking about, because it, it's not really a meaningful construct if it stays at the level that is as high as we are very often talking about it. Right. Um, and I think that's also part of why people get people might get confused when they first look at our field, they're like, well, yeah, of course, you know, we're early saying like, of course, our brains are doing the same thing when we're seeing the same thing. But also for our own purposes, like nobody, nobody, uh, um, nobody outside of the field would talk about like brain research is like, oh, we have, um, let me see, like the brain was active or something like that, right? Or there was similar, like people respond, people's brains responded in similar ways. Like we need to have more specificity to the kinds of hypotheses to really get to get a little further than that. And that was what this was supposed to partly help do. And then also get to this core problem of simultaneity and togetherness, which is something that is really intuitive as a construct, right? Like you don't have to explain to anybody, lay or science, scientist, what that is, but it's very hard to do on command. Like we tried and pretty much failed within dance or two, like on command, do something, together that is not simultaneous or simultaneous that is not together. It just emerges somehow. Um, and it's also difficult to measure, right? To disentangle what the simultaneity is from the uh, togetherness. But I think that's where some of the core questions are that we're trying to all kind of circle around and get to. Well, I will thank uh, Suzanne for that perfect way of uh, summing up the whole field of synchrony. So thank <laughs> you. Um, and there's a, a wild applause. Uh, here for you and for that. And work. so I will be recruiting people uh, at some point starting this uh, summer as well. So if you are interested in the, in the in the multi multi generational project, please do reach out to see if there is a way that we can collaborate on it.